Hello. Hello. How you doing out there? How's everybody going? Happy Thanksgiving, America. Yes. Happy Thanksgiving. When did the Canadian? There's this earlier. They had it earlier. Nobody else has a Thanksgiving thing the they way should, we do. Though. They should. Everybody should. Everybody should. Everybody should be killing turkeys everywhere. Mm. Turkeys. Hello, Marianne and Alexa. And, oh, ah, yes, I love you too, yeah. Alexa. Hi, guys. Oh, uh, just, oh, now we got Donna and Cheryl and all the peeps is coming in. How you doing? Uh, Hi, guys. Hi, everybody. So Amy nice and Nicole and Gail and another Gail. Can't have too many Gails. Cannot. That is one of the rules of happy living. You cannot have too many Gales. Ah, and Denise. You also can't have too many Denises. Hi, oh, River. River. Hi, River. Hi. Oh, another Gale. Yay. Same Gale. No, look, there are there are multiple Gales. Yes, this is fantastic. Monica and Pamela. Woo! You're all here. It happens fast these days. It does. We like it. Look, we got a we got a hundred. I'm like, oh, well, you want to? got a lot to say. I got a lot to say today. Got a lot, a lot to, say, to talk about. I have things She's to psyched. say. She's I've been thinking. It's gonna be a good one. You've been all. thinking all day. Okay, guys. Yes. All right. I'm all right. out of here. Thanks, Badger. <laughs> the notorious, gracious Badger. Mm -mm -mm -mm. There, I like that. You got Guan Yin in the picture. Whoa, Guan Yin. Yes. The Chinese. Well, the Asian goddess of compassion. Yay. Okay, so you guys, it is the holiday and everybody likes to be home for the holidays. And we have spoken before, you and I, about how home is where your soul resides. It's where you are most happy and relaxed. It is not necessarily the house you live in. It is not necessarily even the social nexus in which you live. It's a place that you can create with, no, you can find within yourself, that you can create around yourself, and that you can emanate beyond yourself. So I'm, I wanted to look at going home for the, the holidays with that meaning of the word. And the reason it's so important is that the very traditions that we say take us home for the holidays actually often take us out of that psychological, spiritual home. They take us into places of feeling driven, feeling enslaved by the traditions of the holiday, um, spending money we don't have, buying stuff we don't want for people that we don't like. You know, there are all these having to go to places that are very uncomfortable and interact with people in uncomfortable ways. I, for example, am not really a party person. I love being here with y'all. And it's also the corner of my study. So um, that makes it the best for me. We're going to talk more about that later. But the point is that a lot of us, all the time watching movies and singing songs about home for the holidays, leave that internal home because we get swept up in a bunch of cultural demands. And it's culture or trauma are the two things that can take us away from our natural um, birthright, from living the way our nature wants us to live. So I'm always talking about nature on one side, culture on the other side. They're complementary, but we tend to lose our nature when we um, get overwhelmed by culture. So that never is more true than at a holiday time. So we have to be able to balance the social joys of having a holiday season with the individual preferences that take us home to ourselves. So I wanted to talk about some of the ways of doing that. First of all, remember, there are a thousand paths up the mountain to the same mountaintop, okay? So home is peace and stillness and joy and all that stuff within, but there are many, many paths to it. And if you look at the constructions around holidays, and it doesn't just have to be the holidays here in the West, it's true for a lot of different celebrations in all kinds of different cultures in every people in the world. Everyone has celebrations and um, traditions and everyone has gatherings where they honor those traditions. So this is deep, deep, deep in human psychology, maybe even biology. So there are different ways home. One, you know, my favorite way that I always talk about is peace. If you can go into peace, you can find your way home quite directly. We've spoken about gratitude and the giving and receiving that goes on for many people at this time of the year, whatever your cultural holiday preference, the giving and receiving 
which can become so like fraught with tension and everything is originally a way to awaken gratitude so that when you give to someone you're expressing gratitude for who they are in your life and when you receive from someone you're expressing gratitude for the gift and for the person so both people are experiencing gratitude and giving and receiving at the same time giving love receiving love and that's the way that's why the whole tradition is put in place it's actually a really effective thing but when we get swept up in culture and we lose the internal nature of the act, it becomes empty and we're not home at all. We're away from home. So um, there's gratitude, there's peace, there's joy. And you can, you can um, induce joy by doing things like putting on a lot of lights. Like it's already dark here in Pennsylvania on a winter day at four o'clock in the afternoon. So we've got a fire burning in the fireplace and lighting candles and every, almost every culture in the Northern hemisphere has a festival of lights. You know, in India it's Denali. Um, the Hanukkah is the lighting of the eight candles. Um, and there's all the Christmas candles, which originally are a pagan ceremony, but we'll talk about that in a second. Anyway, just lighting lights helps take us into joy. But if you think you have to put the Christmas lights up despite eight feet of snow on the roof because the children need to be pleased and the in-laws need to be pleased and the, the neighbors need to be impressed, you might as well just shoot yourself with a staple gun because I have done that. And it is both unrewarding and physically dangerous. So now I just settle for lighting a nice fire in the fireplace. Again, I'm going to get back in a minute to how to balance the individual and the collective. So another way that is very prominent as a path home, and which is prominent in the way we talk about winter holidays, but it's not the way we actually do them, is stillness and silence. So silent night, holy night, that whole thing. One of the things about the blanket of snow in parts of the nor Northern Hemisphere, and one of the reasons I love skiing more than any other sport, is that when you are alone in a snowy landscape, it is so quiet and it in that kind of quiet it's a quiet that you don't get unless snow is there muffling all the acoustics especially on like a cloudy day when it's snowing and there's snow on the ground it's like you're in a recording studio it's so silent and you can either go crazy in that silence or you can let it take you inward into a stillness that has no words and no symbols nothing but just stillness that's one of the deepest places to uh, that is home and for people in pre-modern cultures who they could just go out into the snow and walk and feel that we have to actually find silence at this time of year because the culture is blaring right now it's advertising it's jingles it's all um very loud but all is not lost if you don't if there's no way for you to seek silence singing and dancing and music in general are ways to get into a brain pattern that takes you into a deep feeling of contentment so brain scientists found that animals who do mating rituals that involve a kind of dance like birds and some mammals do these repetitive unusual motions only when they're preparing to mate it's a courtship dance and what they found is that the rhythmic unusual movement puts the brain in a state where the sense of self goes away and you feel connected with somebody else or some or everything else and so rhythmic singing and dancing takes us into this space of communion where we lose the sense of self which is part of the experience of enlightenment so that's a way into the deep home inside us so if you can't find silence sing and dance and if, if you love singing and dancing sing and dance if you love silence find silence i'm a silence kind of girl but if you have to sing and dance yes go ahead and do it um another thing that is more questionable and i want to issue a trigger warning for any of you who may have issues with this is um special celebratory concoctions whether that is sugar cookies. I used to make these sugar cookies that had this special glaze that I made up by myself. Um, or if it's 
that special eggnog <laughs> or in the in the Norse cultures they used to drink the the urine of reindeer that had been out eating capsicum mushrooms the red and white mushrooms and they would drink the urine and and the reindeer by the way would be tripping after eating a few mushrooms which is why we have the legend of the flying reindeer the reindeer felt like they were flying also probably like their noses were lighting up and the humans that drank the urine of the high reindeer they got high too and they would like dance around in the snow and feel awesome i guess if you can get capsicum laced reindeer urine and you choose to drink it who am i to be the judge i will not judge you and write to me and tell me how it is because i am never going to try it <laughs> but i'm really curious so and and by the way like mistletoe is another substance that was used and actually i have had a, a mistletoe tea that was prepared for me by a like an herbalist and it's it affects the actual heart and it it causes feelings of warmth and it drops the sensation of being separated it's really interesting it's subtle but it's very definite it, it makes you feel extra loving toward people which is the real reason that folks have mistletoe around it's an ancient druidic potion that literally causes your heart to feel more open and that's why people kiss under the mistletoe oh yes these things go back way into prehistory right like there are people doing this stuff forever long before it became christmas you know when the romans came in and decided that they were going to just take all the major uh celebrations of the cultures that they took over and just make them christian so the holly and the ivy for example is a, it's a Christmas song that's all about how to make the pagan traditions sound Christian. So the holly is, it's another intoxicant and it's considered sacred and the Druids used it, but it has a berry as red as any blood and Jesus, Mary bore sweet Jesus Christ to do for sinners good. It's about, oh yeah, all these, all these uh, ceremonies we do, all about Jesus the whole time. So yeah, they've been modified down through the centuries, but they go back way before there was any written language in a lot of these cultures. Okay, so here's my point. Here is my point. Take any holiday tradition that you practice and just notice whether it serves more your nature, your culture, or, or both. And my premise here is that if it does not serve both, your culture and your nature, it can be tweaked. Now, if it's if it doesn't serve your nature at all and you wanna get rid of it, like if your family's tradition is to get roaring drunk on Christmas and you decide to stop drinking, drop it, don't do it. That's fine. You don't have to keep any of these traditions if they take you away from home. They're meant to take you home. They were designed, they were formulated by the ancestors to take us home. So if they're not taking you home anymore, if getting drunk doesn't take you home, don't go. Don't, you know, drop that tradition and do something else. So there will be things that are traditional and you just love them. Like you just love the whole thing, the Santa thing, the Hanukkah thing, the Kwanzaa candle, everything is just like, yeah, do that, obviously nothing to stop you and there through my life there have been people who genuinely loved things like putting up christmas lights and um christmas caroling and all that stuff and um i was always like struggling to keep up with them <laughs> i mean i loved a lot of the things but not like these people did it served both their nature and their culture now there were things that served my nature and my culture as i said i used to make these cookies the cookies were not the point I made a transparent sugar glaze and then I developed a system of taking food color, straight food color. You dip the tip of a wooden toothpick in color and dot it in the glaze. And then you take another color and do the same thing. And then you swirl all the colors together with the toothpick and it makes like a stained glass. I used to do this for hours and at first I thought I, I was doing it for my kids. That's what a mom does. A mom makes kids Christmas cookies. And then I realized my kids where they were interested for about five minutes and then they're not because they're kids. But I was interested, so I would do it for hours and they could come or go as they pleased. My point is that I took a tradition that was in my family and my ex-husband's family making Christmas cookies. Cookies, meh, I can take them or leave them. But stained glass designs, 
that are like painting, that are like art. Oh, I'm into that. There is a modification of a tradition that was kind of middling for me. It didn't take me away from home, but it didn't take me to my home. As soon as it became an art project, it was home for me. Um, so my, my point is here that we can get too precious about keeping traditions exactly as they have been. And if we do that, they create tons of stress and strain because as people change, the traditions fit better or worse. And it's all really about change and accommodating change. You know, people get married and there's a Christmas where they're happy and then 10 years later, whatever, they get divorced. And there's a Christmas that's about letting go of something beautiful to give way to something else that was beautiful. People are born and there are Christmases that are all about the new babies and people die and there are Christmases about, you know, heartfully um, loving and honoring the tradition of and the, the souls of those who have passed. Every Christmas, every New Year, every Hanukkah, every Kwanzaa, every, everything is going to be a little bit different. So if we're not able to go with that, we're going to get unhappy because things aren't the way they should be. They're not supposed to be any particular way. They're supposed to be conti continuity with change. So for example, the Tibetan tradition, these lamas make these incredibly beautiful sand uh, paintings, mandalas. I mean, intricate. They spend like 10 days making these things. And then they take brushes or I think maybe they blow with their mouth. Anyway, they just sweep the whole thing away, gone. And the whole reason of it is to say impermanence is a continuous feature of our existence and it's fine. You know, but here's the thing. They've been making those same designs for thousands of years and they've been doing the tradition for thousands of years. So even though it's all about impermanence, it's also about repetition. And every Christmas meal is that. Every, um, every Passover is that. Every Easter, every holiday is a, a place where we do the same things, only different. And we acknowledge the fact that it's all passing away and we can always repeat it. It's kind of a fractal form of celebration. So like when I was a kid, um, I was the seventh of eight kids. Decorating the tree was amazing. Like every one of the eight kids and the two parents would take turns putting an ornament on the tree and we'd go around like four times and the tree would be decorated. When all my siblings who are older than I am had gone off to high school, it was just me and my younger sister. And my parents put up a tree. I was like, eh, okay, there's a tree. We were like, eh, we wanted to go hang out with our friends. And my parents were like, well, decorate the tree, children. They were like, all right. And so we took all the decorations, my sister and I, we put them in a clump on, on one side of the tree. So it looked like the tree had a really shiny scab. <laughs> and then we left to go play with our friends. And we thought it was hilarious. We enjoyed it. It was the same thing we'd always done, but it was different. Ah, let's see. Um, we have a new Thanksgiving tradition. And that was that last year, it was our first year in Pennsylvania, right? And we had ordered this incredibly beautiful, Ro ordered this beautiful table, a huge, huge table. So big that it's in two parts and you still can't move either one of the parts. And she ordered it in July with this specific provision that it must be here by Thanksgiving for our big family Thanksgiving dinner. Well, it didn't come and it didn't come and it didn't come. And finally, Ro called the manufacturer and she said, you promised it by Thanksgiving. And they said, well, it's finished by Thanksgiving, but it's in Chicago. And it was the day before Thanksgiving. And so Ro was like, oh, she wasn't mean. She was just, oh. And the person at the delivery company took pity and in the greatest holiday spirit, arranged things. And this is what happened last Thanksgiving. We woke up at seven, the doorbell was ringing. There was a man, standing at the door who had been driving through the night from Chicago. He arrived at four in the morning and parked in our driveway until seven in this sub-zero weather, waiting to give us our Thanksgiving table. So I woke up to the sound of power tools because he and my son-in-law were dragging it in and putting it together. And his name, this fellow was Jesus. So now we have the Jesus table. Uh, but you know, it's our, we have the legend of the Jesus table and how it came with a miracle on Christmas, on Thanksgiving day. And it's fun to add in legends, stories, new songs, 
um, old songs, blend everything together as long as it takes us home. And as soon as it doesn't take you home, go find something that does take you home and do that instead. There's plenty in the holiday tradition to bring everyone home and make space for everyone. So that is what I have to say about that. And if you have any questions, I will now entertain them, please. And I'm gonna ask the notorious badger to come back. Here she comes. And ask me questions, which is her principal it duty. Is your your principal Oscar duty. Of questions. Hello, hello. I come with questions. Yes, what are they? So I have kind of grouped them because um there's a number of people asking sort of similar things and the cool. main one is how to come home when holidays spark fear for some reason or of some sort uh that's really good in fact you can actually i mean if you think about it the lights that we light are because we fear darkness typically you know when you're living in the northern woods in siberia with wolves and bears around you light is a safety thing and so a lot of the traditions are actually designed to keep fear at bay. Um, the singing, the dancing, all of that stuff will actually turn off the brain circuitry that is about fear. But one thing about our culture is we're so verbal and we're so obsessed with reiterating stories of emergency, lack, imminent demise, and so on, that we actually move out of our minds the stories, songs, and customs that take us out of fear. So if you're in fear, it's interesting because we were talking about this. Um, Ro was talking about having to get a bug out of her house or a huge spider or something. They have all they have in Australia is like animals that want you dead and have ways of making you there. Yes. Mm -hmm. But so when she was living in Australia and a huge spider was in the house and she needed to get it out and there was no one else. I needed to get it out. What did you do? You know, you can just kind of force yourself to not be scared in a moment. Is that what I was? Yeah, saying? you were saying you I just, just decided. Like, you just push past it and you go, right, this ends, has to be done. Like this has to be done. And the weird thing about making that shift, I've done it a lot when I've performed, when I've been on stage, when I've been on TV and terrified. I mean, terrified beyond words. I had severe social anxiety. So going out in front of people is really hard for me. And I, what I do is I, I call it the place beyond fear. And the way I trip the switch is that I take the attention off myself and put it on someone else. So if I've got an audience to speak to and there's a thousand people there, instead of thinking, how will I perform? I start to think about people in the back row, like what they may need. They may be sad, they may be stressed, they may be under fire in some kind of way. As soon as I start thinking about them, the compassion circuitry in my brain takes over and the fear circuitry has to die down. And this is the advantage we have that these two things are on a toggle switch. So you've got two parts to your nervous system. You've got the parasympathetic, which calms you down, um, rest and recreate and re reproduce. And you've got the sympathetic, which causes fight or flight fight flight freeze so if you can do anything at all to generate feelings of connection feelings of empathy feelings of um rest that will automatically turn off the fear circuits and the way i always prescribe and it's i've said it a million times but i'll never stop saying it the strongest thing you can do is take a very deep breath with a long slow exhale and we instinctively do that when we're trying to calm down. We know in our circuitry, we know that that calms the brain because it switches that, it turns that switch. So if you can sustain the deep breathing, slow and steady, and you can start to think in terms of what has to be done or what they need rather than what you need, you can distract yourself from your own fear. And once you're in, it's, it's like you have glasses, fear glasses, where everything's terrifying and you can't imagine it not being terrifying. And then you put on the love glasses and it's like, oh, now things aren't nearly as frightening and you can't imagine why you were so frightened. If you've never had that experience, I acknowledge that not everyone's had that experience, but when you have it, go, ooh, make a note, write it in your journal. It's a thing to know. You can turn off fear by turning on compassion and connection. We have a golden retriever in this room right now who is dealing with her fear that she will never get dinner and she's doing a bit of that. 
<laughs> She's putting herself into a parasympathetic <gasps> while also sending a message. I had a beagle. I taught him not to howl for dinner, but they they want so much to howl that he was like, and he learned to sit by me and go. <gasps> <laughs> it was very effective. Okay. Okay, Sandy has a great question here. I love Christmas, but it can be bittersweet. How can you catch yourself when your mind is getting ready to do a nosedive from joy into sadness? How about not catching yourself? How about you ride that wave? Because everything is bittersweet. And a winter light celebration is the definition of a paradox. It's allowing yourself to go high, high, high into the ebullience and the joy of something. And then and to realize, oh, grandpa's not at this party and he was here last year and he's gone. And then you go down deep. So it, it has, it creates bigger waves up and down than most sort of ordinary situations. And if you allow yourself to have permission to feel the whole thing, you will feel an expanded sense of your capacity to be present. And if you can then watch yourself going on these waves, the part of you that is witnessing it is separate from the roller coaster ride, is separate from the waves. And there's a piece there that's home. So you can never stay home if you're trying to keep yourself from being sad at Christmas or at Hanukkah or at Kwanzaa or whatever. You can only go home if you allow yourself to feel whatever you're feeling and then watch it. And all you have to do, I mean, I got up early and sat for a full hour today just going happy. Breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out. Oh, angry. Oh, oh. oh now that's gone. Happy. <laughs> Just watching. And the watching of the emotions pulls you away into a space that is, it's the piece that is not emotional. It's, it's deeper than emotion. It's a place from which emotion can be safely enjoyed. Yeah. Would that apply to feelings of guilt as well? Would you use the mm -hmm. same technique? Yeah. Guilty, guilty, guilty. And the, the, the interesting thing is that if guilt makes you act in some way, then you can see that as useful. If guilt does not make you act, you can start to observe what's happening and say, am I caught between culture and nature? What does my true nature want to do in this situation? I feel guilty for not getting um, Roberta a present as nice as the one she got me. But I keep not getting her nice presents no matter what she gives me. Oh, I feel so guilty. I feel so guilty. Stop and watch. What is the reality? What is the truth? The integrity behind this? I don't want to get caught in a present giving like tournament with Roberta. I barely know the woman. It's not my <laughs> fault that she gives me like a cast iron pheasant in life size detail every year. And now oh, I'm going to do yeah. what's true to my nature. I don't know anyone named Roberta, by the way. If your name is Roberta, I did not mean you. <laughs> so yeah you just you watch and then then you decide what's right for you and if social custom goes against what is right for you you just watch that wither away you can't let it force you and you don't believe onto yourself the condemnations of any cultural system from your family to the to the whole world ah yeah ah, yeah, yeah. You're just a badger you don't care Okay. She used to be the gracious badger. Now she's the notorious badger. She doesn't care. I don't care. Notorious. Yeah. Final question, Martha. There's been a little bit of speculation about whether there is or is not Ooh. reindeer urine of some type. Wow. Well, it's not <laughs> reindeer. <laughs> I mean, how different is a reindeer from any other kind of deer, really? <laughs> I'm glad you took it there. No, no, no. <laughs> Our dogs are eating the solid products of deer. So why should I not drink them? Yeah. No, just eating. Sometimes rolling in. For fun, it's their tradition. It's their way. It's a bittersweet thing for us. Yes. No, it's just bitter. It's very bitter. Okay. okay. Any other questions? We're at the very end. No, we're, that's it. That's the ones that I've got. Okay, so guys, just remember... Go home for the holidays and like through the next weeks coming up, every time you think holiday, 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 think, where's home? How do I get home from here? What do I need to do to get home from here? Do I need to put on a song and dance to it while I make cookies? Or do, do I need to shut it all down and just go by myself and drink reindeer urine? Do 
whatever takes you home as many times as you remember, and it's going to be an awesome holiday. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So we'll see you next week on see The Gathering Room. Thank you so much for being here. We love you. We love you. Bye-bye.